I mean, they've been really wrong about a lot of things, right? Like, and they have these these buzzwords, right? Whether it's transitory or not even thinking about thinking about cutting rates. Like, I feel like I don't believe in the stag or the flation is going to like manifest itself into opposite days. So I think people should be worried about that, you know, because it seems like whatever they say, this like buzzword, um, the opposite happens, right? <laughs> Nancy Davis, founder and portfolio manager of Quadratic Capital Management. It is so great to see you, Nancy, and it's great to welcome you on the show for your debut. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on Fed Day of all days. Thank you. It's an honor to be debuting. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, I love having you on on Fed Day. Um, we just had the FOMC, Jerome Powell's presser, keeping rates held where they are right now. Can we just start with like your reaction to the FOMC today? Which just would love to start there. Well, I felt like Pal was like saying one thing on one side and then saying the exact opposite. It was like 180 degrees, like one statement, and then you hear another statement completely different. Um, I did think it was very interesting that they're going to allow mortgages to run off. And instead of buying more mortgages, they're actually buying treasuries. I thought that was kind of pretty interesting. I think it's so important that people keep focused that the Fed owns, you know, about a third of that $7 trillion that remains in the SOMA holdings. So that's a piece that the New York Fed actually went out and bought in QE. So it's a balance sheet that was actually bought in the open market. About a third of that is mortgages. So yeah, elaborate a bit more there because if that piqued your interest, I imagine other folks might be interested. Why is that? Um, that's because so much of the indices are allocated to mortgages. So, you know, mortgages prior to the savings and loan crisis were actually entirely OTC. And then they got QCIPed after the SNL crisis. And then they're in all of these kind of core fixed income indices have a huge weight. You know, the ag index, for instance, which a lot of people consider core fixed income, about 25% of it is mortgages. And I love to stand on my soapbox about that, Julia, because mortgages, you know, U.S. homeowners are along the option to prepay. So if you own the mortgage in your bond portfolio, you're actually short options to homeowners. And whenever you're short options, you're short vol. It's not it's not equity vol. It's actually fixed income vol that you're short. Um, but I really think it's important that people are aware of that embedded short volatility inside their bond portfolio. Can we explain like what that means exactly, that that short-term volatility within their bond portfolio? Like how does that play out? What does that mean exactly for folks? Yeah. So so what it means is basically as volatility increases in the market, typically correlations tend to increase. And so that means, you know, mortgages will lose money with higher implied volatility. So a lot of people focus on like the VIX and equity vol. And I like to grab people and be like, that's not what you probably have exposure to. It's actually probably short fixed income vol because most people have either, you know, the ag or something that's benchmarked to the ag. Even most institutional portfolios have the ag as their as their benchmark. And there's no inflation protection in the ag and a quarter of it's short vol. So it's just super important because when volatility increases, that means mortgages will lose in price terms, like very simply. Mm -hmm. And just going back to the Fed and their interest rate policy, like even, okay, so like heading into the year, a lot of folks were expecting cuts, like people were expecting like six <laughs> cuts. That's definitely not the case anymore. Yeah. Can I just kind of like get your thoughts on the Federal Reserve's interest rate policy? Because you were saying earlier, like, it's like they're saying one thing and then they say the exact opposite <laughs> thing. Help frame that up for folks. I mean, we've heard that before, right? This is the same same chairman uh, who said he's not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. And then we had one of the fastest tightening cycles, you know, about 5%, five and a quarter percent in 12 months. So, you know, I think we're, you know, shame on us for not believing, you know, him these other times, but it just seemed like everything was so, you know, this and that, this and that, like same old stuff. So... How about this idea that like one of the questions that came up was that they or he one of his answers I was watching I'm some paraphrasing here is that they that he they don't see a Fed rate like they don't see like oh is it not likely that the next move would be a rate hike yeah do you buy that 
Yeah, I mean, I did the the curve did steepen on that comment. You know, that was when, if you look at the the tape, that's when eyeballs started to go up because I guess maybe some people thought a hike could be on the table, and I think that was kind of confirmation that there's no hike. It's just a question of like when they cut, and I think that comes back to like should they cut, right? It's um, you know, at the start of this year, it was all about everybody thought they were going to cut, right? It was just like how much and when. Um, so I feel like we have to get really, we have to be really careful about not focusing too much on consensus and looking more at like what's priced in. Mm-hmm. And when you look at what's priced in, what is that? What is that for you today? Okay, so right now um, we have uh, thirty-four and a half basis points priced in to two thousand twenty-four. But I think the thing that I focus on more is the the yield curve. So if you look at like the twos, tens. SOFR curve, and then you look out one year forward, that's negative 23 basis points. And so a lot of people, you know, focus on all sorts of things. But to me, that that's a really important number to be watching and, and super relevant for what, what I do. Yeah. Um, do, so do you, do you think that we will see a cut this year? Should we have a cut this year? What do you think? I mean, I think probably we will have a cut this year. Whether we should have a cut, I don't really think inflation is something that we can put a pin in. Um, but I think that also presents a great opportunity for investors because most people, you know, like we were talking about before, in their core bond portfolio, they don't have any inflation protected bonds. They don't have any exposure to the rates market. And a lot of people, and I'm sure you hear it all the time, Julia, like people, it's like so group think about you know, people will look at commodities and cyclical equities or other types of the equity market. But that's that's because that's all existed in the 70s, in the last period of really high inflation. The, you know, the interest rate derivative markets didn't exist. The rates market didn't exist. Even even the inflation protected bond market, the Treasury just started issuing uh, tips in the late 90s. So those are all new markets. And you can see it's like a, it's kind of like PAL, right? You have inflation assets in the old school, kind of old economy stuff like commodities. Those are really high, whereas inflation expectations in the rates market are still incredibly low. We still have an inverted yield curve. We still have real yields incredibly high. Um, it's a, it's pretty, pretty interesting, but I think that presents a really good opportunity for investors too. Okay, that is interesting. So like within rates, the opportunity there and okay, walk us through that, maybe a bit more of the thesis there, more persistent, I suppose stick your inflation go forward. Can you just kind of like maybe um explain it so like the maybe more of a lay person could understand it and it sounds like that could be the real opportunity. Yeah, no, I I feel like um a great analogy for like the lay person especially given you know, we're both blondes is uh this is not Barbie world, right? We we live in a real world. It's not, you know, it's not make believe. And everybody has, because of our real exposure to cost of living, has, you know, some amount of savings, no matter what job we're in, no matter what field. And especially if you're not working, you're not going to benefit from any kind of wage increase, right? You're just going to have a higher cost of living. So I think it's really important that people I think a lot of people, especially on like FinTwit, like everybody, I feel like thinks of inflation as a trade, right? Is it going higher? Is it going lower? And I want to grab people and be like, it doesn't really matter. You have exposure to it in your real life. And it's not something that you want to, you know, take a bet that it's going to fall because it's really been priced to fall. People believe that the Fed has tackled inflation, right? The market is pricing that way. You can look at, you know, the real yields in the tips market. You can look at break even curves. You know, they're all hugging around 2.3 right now. So the Fed might say, you know, even the realized CPI is it's just an index, right? It's not the only way to think about inflation. That's interesting. This notion that like inflation's not a trade. I want to hear a bit more on that. That that's interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, I think um, was it Reagan who said inflation's a thief in the night, right? It's you know, it basically means your life savings has less purchasing power, right? Whether whatever you want to buy. And that's that's my big thing with creating eyeball is that 
TIPS, which are Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, they were created by the Treasury in 1997. They're all long duration, right? So they all lose money on their duration exposure because they're bonds. And then the only index used to reset and use look to inflation is the consumer price index, right? And like in the equity world, nobody would go buy, I don't know, the Dow Jones or the Russell or the NASDAQ and say, ta-da, I have, I have the US equity market. So it seems bizarre, like even the Fed doesn't use just the CPI index, right? They, they're looking at the service section or they're looking at PCE or their survey data. So it's kind of bizarre that people would use one index in, in tips, which is just CPI. And that's what we access inside of Eyeball. We take, we take that core tips portfolio, which is about 80% of the fund, and then we add fully funded interest rate options on top to access another, another index, per se, to capture inflation expectations. And for folks who are watching and listening, when you are when you are mentioning IVOL, that is the quadratic interest rate volatility and inflation hedge ETF, the ticker symbol I V O L IVOL. Can you, you explain Julia, I, I, I what say, IVOL? When I say it, I feel like I'm saying eyeball. Right? <laughs> it, well, it, maybe the the transcript might pick it up that way. The AI that, that transcribes these things, mm-hmm. but explain IVOL for folks. Um, like just give them a bit more context on it. I mean, I do have actually have a couple of viewer questions they wrote in specifically asking about eyeball, so we'll get to those. But just like um, you know, set the table there for folks who are watching and listening. Yeah. So so eyeball is mostly uh, tips. Those are Treasury inflation protected securities. We actually use a passive Bloomberg Tips Index uh, to buy our tips exposure. It's about eighty percent of the fund, um, and then we add interest rate options to the portfolio. Now they're they're long options because we're buying the option. Um, because when any, whenever you buy an option, you're long volatility. So there are lots of different types of volatilities. Um, a lot of people look at like VIX, which is short dated equity volatility. We own interest rate volatility. So it's a different type of volatility. It's more similar to what people have exposure to if they have US mortgages. Um, and that type of volatility is pretty long dated. The average tenor of options inside the the eyeball portfolio is about 19 months. So, um, you know, they're not. And then we have a whole portfolio of options. Some of them expire in 2027. So it's longer dated and more sensitive to volatility increasing in uh, in the fixed income market. So when does something like that perform well? Like what kind of environment are we talking about? Like what kind of macro environment? So it's kind of interesting because with most bond funds, you know, if you just think about like, let's just take an investment grade bond, you're making, you're making two bets, right? You want yields lower. And then if it's a bond with credit risk, you want credit spreads tighter. With Ival, we want lower real yields because we have tips. So we have exposure to real yields. And then we want the spread between short and long dated rates to widen. And that's kind of interesting because that can happen in a lot of different types of macro environments. Like it could happen, you know, I love that Powell was like, I don't believe in stag or inflation today. Like, what was that? That was a stupid, Mm -hmm. stupid comment. I bet he rehearsed that in the mayor. (laughs) um, Anyway, stagflation is one of those environments where you could have the yield curve steepening. The yield curve is currently like very inverted. It's one of the most inverted yield curves that we've seen in our lifetime. And that can normalize or uninvert because, you know, because people think there's going to be more, you know, higher, more persistent inflation, lower growth because the Fed can't cut rates, or it could be more of a risk off environment, like, you know, around Silicon Valley Bank, the expectations that the Fed was going to cut rates to save the banking system increased. And, you know, I've all had a really good, it was a week, you know, we had a really good, good week of performance with that expectations for further rate cuts. So it's kind of either or it's either lower front dated yields or higher long dated yields. Some people call it the um, uninversion of the yield curve because it's currently inverted or the steepening and it doesn't matter if it's bull or bear steepening and then rising volatility because we're long options. So we're long fixed income ball. Did I explain that well? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so are you, would you be buying like call options right now within IVOL? Like are they, is it like low implied volatility right now? Um, so we have longer dated options inside the portfolio because the vol curve is actually downward sloping. So the longer dated options have a cheaper level of volatility. Um, that's the backwardation in the vol curve. Um, so that's pretty attractive to own. And then vol has fallen a lot this year. Um, if you kind of put a pin in, if you remember last year, like around, let's pick Halloween, um, you know, remember November, December, we had a massive rally of like everything, right? Everything went up um, and vol collapsed during that period. So vol's down about 30% in this market, um, which is, which is OTC. It's not, it's not the move index. People are always like, oh, is it the move? It's not the move index. It's a different type of rate volatility. Um, and there is no index for it. But, um, but yeah, vol is down substantially this year. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support and enjoy the rest of the interview. Okay, so... I've heard you talk in the past about the rates market and that it's like one of these, maybe it's a leading indicator for you. It's one of those markets that like ha sends out some signals. Like what to you or what right now is the rates market signaling um, that folks might not be, you know, aware of or paying attention to just, you know, curious what the signals are today? Well, the, the spot yield curve has started to uninvert. Um, and I think that's really important for people to keep an eye on because typically, I mean, it's not always the case, right? There's never an always in investing. It's all, everything involves risk. But typically, if you go back to like, say, the 50s, you can even look at the treasury curve. When the curve starts to uninvert, typically that's a precursor to recession. And so it's right now, People feel pretty good, right? Like think about how how different the market sentiment feels now versus like coming into 23, right? Everyone was bearish going into 23. And now kind of most people are feeling pretty good about risk markets, whether it's credit, you know, the investment grade two-year CDX. This is the credit spread on investment grade bonds. It's 22 basis points, like two two. It can only go to zero, right? There's like very little spread in credit. Um, a lot of markets are pretty euphoric right now. So I think that's something that she, people should be watching because when everyone gets complacent about one direction, usually it's pretty cheap to add hedges and other kind of diversifying things to your portfolio. Interesting. Okay. So markets are euphoric. People should be paying attention to that. Um, do you, I don't know how much uh, you kind of focus on the macro or usually this, Nancy, when I start the show, I, my first question for guests is always like, you know, what is your macro picture, the framework in which you're looking at the world today? And you can take all the time you need to set the table. Like, um, I would love to get the macro from you, um, but maybe understanding, is that something that you you pay attention to in your role? Or is that something that's really important? Just would love to kind of get your assessment when it comes to the macro side of things. I'm glad you asked me that, Julia, because I know, you know, we were talking, I love listening to macro pundits. Like definitely, I find it interesting. I love macro. I have my own like, you know, view of the world. But the reality is, is like, no one has a crystal ball about what's going to happen in the macro environment. And even if you get certain outcomes correct, the way markets move are also, you know, doesn't mean if you get if you get an outcome right, it doesn't mean you know how markets are going to move, right? Because so much is about positioning and sentiment. Um, so I think it's tricky. That's why, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I don't think inflation to me is a trade. I think it's something that people should have inside their financial portfolio in whatever way you want, just because I think everyone is exposed to it, right? And I think you get more exposed the older you get. Because the older you get, the less, you know, if you think about your your personal balance sheet, right? If, you, if you're not working, you're not going to benefit from wage inflation. You're just going to have a higher cost of living. And everybody has, you know, a certain amount of savings. And, and having, to me, I think 
we're in this macro environment, that macro environment. But I think at the end of the day, people really should just in case have some, you know, be prepared for stagflation, be prepared for inflation. And especially with the rates market kind of giving it to you, it's it, the market is saying, the Fed's got this, don't worry, <laughs> right? That seems to me like a, a good opportunity to buy and have something just in case. Interesting. So is that the is that the equity market that's signaling the Fed's got this, don't worry, but the rates market signaling something different? No, no, it's actually the rates market that's signaling that because oh, because we have a like we have a super inverted yield curve in the uh, in the U.S. So these are just this is just Bloomberg codes um, pulling into Excel, and this is looking. Not every market in the world has an inflation protected bond market. You know, so there are a lot of blanks here because. You know, Canada stopped issuing inflation protected bonds. Germany start, stopped issuing, but you can look at current CPIs around the world. And I love to look at this one in particular at Japan. If I could just highlight that, you can see, you know, Japan has a positive upward sloping, which is considered normal yield curve. Um, this is the JGB curve. And then um, this is swaps curves. This is the JPY swap curve. It's positive 62 where the US is negative 65. So this is a chart of, you know, the twos, tens swap curves. This is not the treasury curve, it's a swap curve. And this puts together LIBOR and then with the whole market transitioned uh, to SOFR, but you can see the, the red line is zero. So meaning no difference between the two and the 10 year interest rate. Right now it's been below zero for one of the longest periods, you know, in our lifetime, right? Um, and this goes, back to the history of the swap market data, which started in the 80s. So the Treasury issued tips around this period, but you can see the times when the curve has steepened in the past is typically you know, not something good happening. And that's why I was talking about, look, people should pay attention to this because here, you know, this was the, the tech bubble bursting. This is the financial crisis. Um, the curve steepened a little bit here. This is going into COVID, right? What did it know? Um, but right now it's so inverted. I think it's a, this is what Ival has exposure to. We have, they're not called call options, but they're similar to um, call options on that curve. So do you, you watch out when it starts to de-invert? Yeah. So we we benefit from the the normalization, the uninversion, mm -hmm. the steepening, the widening of the twos, ten spread. People have like, there's a lot of jargon <laughs> around what people call it. But <laughs> yeah, that, huh. that line going up <laughs> is good. <laughs> So how about the yield curve, um, the inverted yield curve, rather, as like an indicator, um, you know, before recession, do you, do you do you have that kind of factored in? How much does that matter? Do you see, is it signaling that we're headed to a recession? What do you think? I mean, a lot of people, it's sort of chicken or egg about which one comes first, right? Like, if you think about what is, you know, the yield curve is where people lend money longer. And it's it's not normal to have it inverted. Because think about it, it's like right now people are like, here, Janet Yellen, let me give you money for longer and pay me less for a longer dated loan, right? That That's not normal. Um, so it's, um, it's kind of a question, does the yield curve inversion stop the extension of credit? Like, does it cause the economy to choke off or is it, or is it a crystal ball and it predicts a recession? Like, I don't know which comes first, but typically that uninversion is is not great for risk assets and it's kind of starting to uninvert whether you look at like the treasury curve is less inverted than the swaps curve um but we we wrote a, a white paper actually kind of looking at looking at historical periods because the question we always get is like when when is it going to uninvert um so it's for it's for financial professionals only it's not um not approved for retail but it's on our fun website for those people who are financial professionals. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you um, a question that came in. This came in from someone who's friends with you um, named Leslie. And she would like to know when would be a good time to invest in bonds if rates stay higher for longer? Oh, I love Leslie. Thank you. I'm a skater girl. Um, okay. So yeah, you do know. Know, right? <laughs> I know exactly who that is. Um, no, Leslie's awesome. And yeah, it's just it's it's tricky because, you know, if you think rates are going to be higher for longer, you definitely don't want to be buying long duration, especially with an inverted yield curve, because you're not getting paid for that, you know, that you're not getting paid a premium, you're actually almost paying a task to own longer dated bonds. Like, 
you can buy a T bill and get paid, you know, five forty, or you can buy a longer dated bond and get paid less to take more risks. So it's kind of um, it's kind of not a not a great time to own bonds that are long duration um, because you're not really getting compensated right now for a longer duration risk. Mm-hmm. This question came in from someone named Patrick who knows you, and he would like to know, and we asked this earlier, will the Fed cut this year? Will they cut before the election? <laughs> I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, and I think Patrick's really good at at macro and watching the markets. Um, I think they probably will cut. I don't know if they should cut, though. That would be what I will. That's going back to my point that I think it's a great time to buy inflation in the rates market for your portfolio because it's really priced at a very complacent level with you know rate vol being down substantially this year the yield curve you know really massively inverted the forward curve has actually inverted about 30 basis points more this year in 2024 so it's gone even though the spot curve is higher the forward curve is more inverted and then real yields are much higher, which means, you know, inflation protection in the rates market is cheaply priced because higher real yields means lower prices. And what would you say is like your overall assessment of the Federal Reserve the last few years um, and their handling of, I mean, there's so many different areas we could throw in there, but just maybe we'll just keep it broad. Like what has been your overall assessment of the Fed? I mean, they've been really wrong about a lot of things, right? Like, (laughs) and, and they have these these buzzwords, right? Whether it's transitory or not even thinking about thinking about cutting rates. Like I feel like I feel like the the stag, I don't believe in the stag or the flation is going to like manifest itself into opposite day. So I think people should be worried about that, you know, because it seems like whatever they say, this like buzzword, um, the opposite happens, right? Yeah. What do you what do you think, so Julia? You, okay. So- I don't know. Like, so it does beg the question, like, do you think that we could be headed into like more of a stagflationary environment? Things start to slow down. Inflation's still there. Like, what's kind of your thought process there? Um, So stagflation is obviously the worst environment for investors, right? Because that's higher prices, lower growth. Um, It's kind of, it's actually a made up term because they didn't know how to describe it the last time it happened in the US. So the economists like made up this term. Um, I do think That's likely an environment where eyeball probably will do well. Obviously, we don't know because it didn't exist during that last period of stagflation. But we talk about that in our in our white paper about stagflation. And I think that will I think that will mean, you know, higher higher fixed income volatility. Right. Because imagine imagine all the portfolios that assume stocks and bonds are negatively correlated. Right. In a stagflation environment they actually go positively correlated. Even if you have like a risk parity model that flips to be, oh, a little less correlated, right? That's really, you know, so I think rising ball sound makes a lot of sense to me. I think the curve would be a lot steeper, especially with so much of our debt having to be refinanced and also the rest of the world financing our debt, you know, because the Fed's not buying anymore. They're trying to still do quantitative tightening and reduce their balance sheet. Um, and then I think the yield curve would likely uninvert during that period. Um, it's a question of which would come first. Would the back end move first or the front end? But I think it it would likely be a steeper curve. But and that those all three of those things are are good for the eyeball strategy and kind of the opposite have been happening this year. <laughs> yeah. Um before I let you go, like one of the things I learned about you, like just preparing for this conversation was, um, and I want you to share more too about your background that, gosh, you've been trading options since you were in college. Yes. Um, you were on the prop desk at Goldman um, from like the 90s through the financial crisis, um, probably a sovereign debt crisis in there. You started your own firm in 2013. Can you just kind of share more, Nancy, about like your own like journey in markets, what kind of brought you into the space, um, why the route that you took in particular? Would just love to kind of hear more about your own background. Oh, well, thanks, Julia. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I think I think when you find something that you enjoy doing and you, you do it in your free time, that's a, a great place to make a career for yourself. I mean, I'm a little unusual because I'm not 
I'm not a fan of derivatives. I know that sounds really weird, right? Um, being somebody who has an interest rate volatility and inflation hedge ETF, but most most derivatives are linear derivatives, meaning they go up a dollar, down a dollar, and they're just leverage, in my opinion. So it's kind of like I think the best way to to describe it is like a credit card where you you get exposure to something, but you don't you're just paying like a financing fee to buy that. Um, I throughout my career, even before I got to Goldman's prop desk, was investing with long options. And I like that a lot because you can know you can know how much you can lose, right? And then when you're right, you have this asymmetric payoff. Now, nothing is free. You have to manage all the different Greek exposures that come along with that. But I think it's a really neat way to manage risk. Um, and it's something that you know, I applied to, I didn't know anybody at Goldman Sachs. I just applied off the internet, you know, sent my resume in. And, you know, I guess I had kind of a unusual resume um, being somebody who liked to trade options. <laughs> you know, it's not normal, right? Um, no, I mean, probably not many college students doing that then or even today. So yeah, it's incredible. I think it's the best way to learn though. Like when you're interested in something, I think allocating a small amount of your life savings to really kind of learning and doing it yourself is a great way to learn. Um, and yeah, I just, I totally, I totally dig buying options and it's like my thing. <laughs> and, um, and it's neat because if you think about it, like most of the world sells options, right? They buy whatever their core portfolio is. Like, let's just take stocks to keep it simple. They buy stocks and then they sell call options against it, right? That's so popular. Like anytime you see right buy right, that means, you know, buying calls, buying, buying the underlying, you know, index or stocks and then selling calls. And I'm not picking on that strategy. It's just that it seems like all backwards to me because if you really want equities, don't you want the upside, right? Do you really want to like sell away the upside for a little bit amount of premium that the most you can make when you sell an option is the day you sell it, right? You're just, you just want it to go away. You want it to expire. And so I think there's actually a lot of alpha on taking the other side of all the option sellers in the world where you send, instead of saying, I'm going to take my linear, whatever, stocks, bonds, portfolio, and sell options on it, what if you just make the long options your portfolio? <laughs> it's, it's different. I have to say, Nancy, I've enjoyed having you on the show. I want to give you the final few minutes here. Um Okay, so let folks know where they can find, you know, more of your work, maybe plug if they can find you or follow you on social media. And let's leave the audience with some parting thoughts, maybe something that you want to reinforce from the conversation, or it could be something that we didn't even bring up that you'd like to leave um, for the audience to think about. Um, so I, uh, I do use LinkedIn. Um, and I did recently join Twitter, I got kind of or X, I'm sorry, X. Um, It'll always be Twitter. <laughs> I, I hate that name. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, so I'm on both of those. Uh, I don't post a ton uh, on Twitter just because it's it's really a pain with um, you kind of all the steps that you should go through um, from a compliance point of view. But I, I do use that. And then we have um, websites too. So, you know, do you want me to give the website, Julia? Yeah, okay. go for it. So, yeah, plug away. Um, you know, our, our biggest fund is is eyeball, not eyeball. It's I like inflation volatility. So it's eyeballetf.com. If people want to learn about that fund, we have we have another fund too. Um, and then you know you can just Google me or Quadratic and uh, hopefully get some more information. But we have lots of lots of stuff out there. I try to be, you know really open about what we do and talk to people about it. It is, it is different, right? It's, you know, but I think difference good, right? You know, if the same way or having the same benchmark, you know, you have a portfolio that's correlated to itself, right? So I would just say, be really careful if you own short duration, that would be my one Short duration is fine if it's government bonds, but if you have, it drives me just crazy because credit curves, credit curves can, can, you know, invert, like sometimes people hear about like the VIX curve inverted. That means 
front dated vol goes higher than long dated vol and credit curves, the same thing can happen. So you know, think about it. if you're a company and you're borrowing money and you need to pay it back and you have a, a payment coming due, say it's a short duration bond and it's due in the next year, you either have to pay it back or you have to amend and extend the loan with the lender. And so right now, credit curves are very upward sloping. It's like actually opposite of the yield curve. So short dated credit is extremely tight, meaning you get paid very little premium to own a short dated bond with credit risk. Um, like I mentioned, the you can pull up like the, the two year investment grade bond index is 22 basis points, right? That can only go to zero. And so I think you just have to be really careful about short duration to make sure that you don't have a lot of expensive credit in those portfolios because you're really not getting paid for it. Um, so I think the problem is, is we've had, you know, 525 basis points of rate hikes in a very short period. So right now everybody's, you know, freaking out about duration, which they should be because the yield curve is inverted. You're not getting paid to take duration risk. But credit, credit is very similar beta to equities, right? Because it's still, it's corporates, right? So if you have, you know, let's take an example, Microsoft stock, and then you own Microsoft bonds, you don't really have a different beta. You just have a different part of the capital structure. So just say, just don't go by name only, just because something says short duration, you got to look into it and see how much credit is in it you know, what type of structured credit it is. Structured credit is levered mortgages, right? It's it's leverage. So especially with the Fed, you know, not not buying mortgages, not reinvesting, they're going to let them expire. And a third of the balance sheet is mortgages. Just be real careful with short duration to dig into it. If it's all governments, it's fine. No, no problem with, uh, with that. But just be careful of credit. And anytime you see those Three letter acronyms like ABS, MBS, you know, CMBS, um, CMO, those things are something to look into. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to sneak one more question because I, I lied. I, I have one okay. question. Do you think the 10 year is going to go to 5%? My last guest, he made a case that he thinks that's going to happen and that mm, it, it could have other implications for other asset markets. Just would love to get your reaction to that. Um, you know, look, I think the longer we're in the higher for longer environment and the Fed doesn't uh, cut, I think, yes, it probably should go higher, right? Because because the overnight lending rate is 525, right? You can, it's literally the, the amount to lend overnight. So it doesn't make a ton of sense to have, you know, think about it, you're, you're giving, here, Janet Yellen, take my money for 10 years instead of overnight and pay me less, right? That doesn't make a ton of sense. Yeah, certainly. Well, I have to say, Nancy, it's been a pleasure having you on. I really appreciate you taking the time to join me, especially on That's Fed end. Day. I know this is probably a crazy busy day for someone like yourself, but Nancy Davis, founder and portfolio manager at Quadratic Capital Management. I really appreciate you being so generous with your time, your ideas, all of your knowledge. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Julia. It's really a pleasure.